We are on the cusp of some of the biggest and most significant changes in the crypto space ever. And we're going to be talking about these crossroads right now with Alex Mashinsky, CEO of Celsius Network, a financial services firm dedicated to creating crypto lending and depository products. We're going to be talking about announcements for not just Celsius, but the crypto space at large today. You have some very important announcements for everybody following your work. Welcome back to the show, Alex. Hi, David. Thanks for having me back. There's a whole list of topics all the way from Ethereum to your Bitcoin price projections to what Celsius is doing right now with your mining uh, ventures, proof of community that you just started today. And of course, you know, uh, what people can expect from regulations. We covered this in a previous episode. I want to revisit that topic again. Before we continue, if you're watching this right now, where do you think the Bitcoin price is going to go this year? Right in the comments down below. We'll compare your answers to Alex Mashinsky's forecast at the end. Alex will give his forecast once more. Alex, let's start with the Ethereum flippening. This is something that is relatively new. I had to look it up myself. Uh, this is something a year ago you said, you know, Ethereum's going to surpass Bitcoin. People, people will laugh at me when I said that. But now it looks like it might be happening. What indicators are you watching that suggest to you that this is happening right now? Yeah, so the Celsius community is now uh, almost a million strong. And uh, inside our community, which again, you can watch all those numbers by downloading our app, uh, the flipping already happened. Uh, Ethereum uh, already surpassed Bitcoin in dollar terms as the total holdings of the Celsius community. And I think that the broader market will follow it. Uh, in the next year or two, we'll see that flipping happening also in the broader market. Uh, when people think that I uh, live in the future or I have a special skill at seeing the future, all I do is look at the Celsius numbers and what the hodler community at Celsius is telling me every day. So they're currently, okay, so, there's, so it's by volume right now with a number of people, number of transactions. What, what's the measurement here? The, the measurement is by uh, how, how much in dollar terms does, do these million people hold? Do they have in dollar terms more Bitcoin or do they have in dollar terms more Ethereum? So Ethereum just okay. surpassed Bitcoin in the last uh, month or two. Okay. And it's the first time ever that our million users had more. We, we manage about 17 billion in deposits or in, uh, in customer coins. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, you know, the total held, the number one coin held in dollar terms is, is Ethereum. Well, I'm looking at the market cap right now comparison. $630 billion for Bitcoin at today's price is $250 billion, $250 billion roughly for Ethereum. That's still a significant difference. The flipping refers to a possible scenario in which Ethereum overtakes Bitcoin in market cap. Could this happen? Will it happen? Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. That, that uh, I think the use case for Bitcoin is store of value. The use case for Ethereum is yield. And yield as an application, uh, it just has a broader uh, user base, right? There's more people in the world who are, who are vying for yield than people in the world are saying, uh, I, uh, I'm afraid of my uh, fiat currency. I'm just going to park some uh, 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 value, right? I'm going to move some value from my fiat, from my dollar, from my Canadian dollar, from my yen to Bitcoin. So I think over time... Uh, you will see um, a broader adoption of Ethereum than of Bitcoin, but obviously both of them are exceptional uh, applications and exceptional uh, blockchains, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we will see a broad adoption of both. It's just that one will exceed the other. Just before we move on, Alex, there's a lot of criticisms about Ethereum's expensive gas fees and other technological hiccups. Uh, Ethereum 2.0 is supposed to address some of these technological problems. What do you think of this initiative? Yeah, so we were uh, one of the participants in Ethereum 2. We contributed 25,000 uh, ETH into the project before it actually launched. So that was 10 times more than Vitalik did. He did 2,500. So we're a big supporter of ETH2. But what happened since, uh, what happened basically this year is that uh, layer two solutions like uh, Matic and others have launched. And uh, because of that, uh, the price of the gas fees on Ethereum is actually dropped by 90%. So 
So now there's no more uh, issues. I mean, now the, you can do a transaction every day on Ethereum and pay less than $10, which is still probably high, but it used to be during the busy days, it would be as high as $500. So definitely, uh, I think we solved the problem in the near term, layer two solutions, but ETH2 will be a, a, a very important and incremental improvement, and both of those solutions will continue to co- operate in, in tandem. You brought up a key word, and then we're going to move on to the next uh, theme here. You brought up the key word, which is adoption. Adoption for Ethereum. Of course, there's constant adoption for Bitcoin. It's ongoing. Let me, let me just tell you a little story here. Last night, I had dinner with a friend. He's a, he's a crypto hodler. Very, uh, he, he bought in early, so he's doing great. He's doing great, uh, very well. So, you know, he, he asked me, David, do you think Bitcoin is more likely to hit $100,000 this year or zero? This is a philosophical question, of course. It's not going to hit zero. But I asked him, I asked him, man, look, what are the assumptions you need to make for zero dollars of Bitcoin price? Well, it, basically, it need, it, everybody needs to sell. The entire hodler community needs to abandon Bitcoin overnight. I said the probability of it happening is zero. But w- let, let's just brainstorm for a second. What are the scenarios in which that could possibly happen? And we discussed that possibly if everybody's crypto wallets get hacked, everybody would it, it, w- it would dissuade the community from buying anymore. I think that's one possible scenario. There's a lot of talk about quantum computers in a couple of years possibly having that ability. Millions of times faster in processing speed, it could potentially hack into anything. Is that a concern for you? Yeah, so uh, earlier this week, I had I was on a panel with the head of cryptography and quantum computing for IBM and a few other experts, and we talked exactly about this topic. And you have to understand that, uh, let's say tomorrow morning, somebody hacks uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum because they have uh, the world's uh, strongest computer, and nothing happens to the history of blockchain. It's just that, Going forward, we have to fork the chain and make it quantum resistant. And uh, today, the most sophisticated computers are running uh, probably 400 qubits. That's like the latest and greatest stuff that's uh, still in testing in labs. Uh, And you need thousands of these uh, qubits to be able to uh, even uh, try to attempt to uh, break the hash 256. Uh, encryption. Um, I think that uh, you know we are years away from that happening, and uh, uh, almost every chain has the time to effectively become quantum resistant. Also, yeah. these chains are are the young chains have a much higher uh, uh, risk of being hacked because they're not as resistant, right? Because on on Bitcoin, you have to hack or you have to break 12 years worth of blocks, right? Where on a new chain, you might have to break only one year worth of blocks. So the Bitcoin is definitely a thousand times more secure and more safe than anything that comes after it. And maybe the second safest network would be Ethereum, but Bitcoin is a thousand times more safe because it's a logarithmic scale. It's not a linear scale. Uh, with the need, how much computation you need to break the chain. So I don't see any of that happening in the next five to 10 years. Uh, Well, maybe the uh, large coins have that infrastructure. What about the altcoins? What about the uh, thousands of other smaller coins? So tokens are things that run on somebody else's blockchain. For example, the cell token, which Celsius has, runs on the Ethereum blockchain. So ETH is a coin, cell is a token, and all of the tokens, there's 10,000 tokens out there, are effectively are relying on the cryptography, on the strength of the Ethereum network. You break the Ethereum network, you broke all those 10,000 uh, tokens, right? So other coins or other chains that have their own uh, uh, coin, uh, there you have to look at each case and decide if their cryptography is stronger or not. Some of these chains were specifically developed to be quantum resistant, right? So there are several chains, uh, there's about 200 chains out there. Several of them are specifically uh, designed to be quantum uh, resistant. But Alex, just uh, in layman terms, if, if, a crypto, if a crypto skeptic were to say to you, Alex, I'm not so sure, you know, I, why would I buy something that has the risk? Obviously you've explained why the risk is small, but the risk of being hacked. 
by an extremely advanced computational uh, machinery. If you want to rob my cash, you have to physically come and get my cash, right? Well, <laughs> it, I mean, yeah, it's where is yeah, where is this network? That's, yeah, that's not that's just not true, right? I mean, uh, hackers manage to get into the NSA and to every U.S. agency. Uh, so there's a pretty high chance that hackers can get into the Fed or to SWIFT or to some other network and steal your mm -hmm. cash, right? So what you're relying on, each one of us who has fiat, we're relying on uh, the uh, Federal Reserve or on some other agency replenishing these losses if they take place. And we're relying mm -hmm. on lack of moral hazard. We're relying on the fact that if banks fail, uh, that uh, the Federal Reserve or somebody else is going to put a safety net under the entire economy like they did in 2019 and 2008 and 2000 and 1990, right? But that's not a given, right? If things are really bad, they may actually do what they're supposed to do, which is let the banks, the bad banks fail. So, so there's a very high risk. I see much more risk in the fiat system, which is leveraged 20 to 1 with fractional reserve than in a system in which there's no leverage. In the Bitcoin networks, there's very, very little leverage uh, because if you want Bitcoin, you have to buy it. You know, you have to actually spend fiat to buy it. Have you spoken to cybersecurity firms about their developments in the crypto space? Sure. We, look, we, we, have, uh, we were the first in the world, I think, to implement MPC, multi-party computation. And right now, almost everybody's using it. We're now using two layers of that technology to make sure that our customers uh, have the safest place to manage their keys. And, yeah. and uh, we, we are on the latest and greatest. Uh, we always look at uh, technology. We're a technology company. Uh, we have uh, close to 400 people and, and many of them just deal with what you just talked about yeah. and test new technology, verify new technology. Uh, and there's great tech coming out of the US, Canada, Israel, all of the stuff that uh, we're continuously implementing to make it even safer for our users. We're gonna talk about the mining project that, that your company is involved with right now. Before we get into that, I wanna show the audience the hash rate. This of course is the uh, amount of computing power dedicated to the network. I'm noticing just eyeballing this chart that it has a rough correlation with the price of Bitcoin. This is the Bitcoin hash rate chart and it roughly looks like a Bitcoin price chart if you didn't put the title in. Can you explain any sort of relationship. We know why it's dropped. We know China just banned 90% of its mining capacity. That possibly could explain that big drop. Uh, what, what's your take on this chart? Yeah, so correlation is not necessarily always causation, right? So the, right. the, the FUD or the scare uh, that's happening right now in China uh, and the exodus of Chinese miners uh, out of China is partially to blame because they do need to liquidate some of their Bitcoin to pay for the transfer and pay their loans and things like that. Uh, but uh, basically, anytime you have bad news, you have uh, short sellers and other type of traders piling up on the bad news to try to push prices lower and liquidate uh, the longs, liquidate the people who are on margin, right? So. Yes, there's bad news coming out of China, but I can tell you that uh, actually less than half of the miners in China have been shut down to date. And in the Sichuan uh, province, even though the central government has instructed everybody to shut down, most of the hydro dam uh, mining going on in the Sichuan province is still going on. So, so we will see that uh, basically um, go out of the system by the end of this year. And that represents a great opportunity, right? That it represents an opportunity to further uh, decentralize Bitcoin. Instead of 65% of the mining being in China, uh, we made uh, our largest investment in, in, in the company's history. Also, uh, over $200 million invested in North America. We're now making another $60 million investment in Canada to basically move a lot of this capacity, a lot of this infrastructure to North America and use the renewable resources to further secure and uh, decentralize the Bitcoin network. Yeah, we don't typically talk about your company as a miner, but that's, that's, I mean, that's a significant amount of money to be invested. $200 million was just made. Do you have another round of investments coming up? You told me this offline. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so we're, we're committing another 60 to 80 million. Again, most of that is gonna be in Canada. Some of it is gonna be in the US. And uh, that makes us uh, the largest, will make us the largest miner in North America. 
And uh, the reason it's very important for us is because our users are looking for yield on Bitcoin. And what they want to see is more and more uh, security on our ability to deliver this yield. Today, we mostly lend to institutions, exchanges. We do some DeFi. Uh, we also issue loans to, to users, to retail users, margin borrow. But uh, basically, instead of earning yield through these loans, we can build a Bitcoin factory and just mm -hmm. create Bitcoin and deliver it to our customers, right? So, so it's uh, obvious we owe Bitcoin, we make Bitcoin. It's a back-to-back -back transaction, unlike most miners who are in it just to create dollar profits, right? If you're familiar with some of the other public companies in the space, their job is to create, they invest dollars and their job is to deliver dollar profits for their shareholders. Okay. So we have a different well, mission and uh, we are making big investments to make sure that we can deliver that yield in kind to our customer. Well, look, uh, I'm not, I, I don't mean to spread FUD. I don't shoot the messenger. I didn't say this, but uh, the, the Bank of International Sediments, the BIS, said that Bitcoin has few redeeming attributes. This is their quote from a recent research report. So my question is now, look, the, the Chinese Central Bank is not the only, only political body that hates Bitcoin. You've got the Central Bank Committee, the BIS, now openly stating that they're opposed to the concept of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, as a, as a medium of exchange. Are you concerned then that governments might be pressured to shut you down as a miner in North America? Basically, what happened in China? Could that happen to miners in North America? And by, by you, I mean all miners in North America, not just Celsius. Sure. So first, uh, China, while it hates miners and it hates Bitcoin, is launching the world's largest cryptocurrency. It's a CBDC, meaning it's yes. issued by the Chinese government. It's centralized. Yes. It, it's nothing like Bitcoin, but the Chinese digital yuan is a cryptocurrency, right? So, so while they hate Bitcoin uh, and they say bad things about Bitcoin, they're doing effectively a digital Bitcoin, right? They're just their own version of it. So all China did is clear the way to make sure that there's no competition for their own product, right? And the BIS, uh, they just need to remove one letter on their, in their name and they will be describing, you know, if they remove the I in their name, they'll be describing their services pretty accurately. But the point is, is that uh, central banks are like a hammer. Anything they see is a nail and they're just going to hammer you to death uh, uh, because they don't want any competition. They're not there to help technology or help 7.8 billion people. They're there to make sure uh, that, um, you know, the status quo remains. I, I want to quote Hester Pierce, who's a, who's a commissioner of the SEC, who in the last few months stated this several times, and I'm quoting her. She said, it is not the job of the regulator to protect the incumbents. That's all I have to say. You know, it's interesting you brought up central banks. Uh, don't you feel as an investor of Bitcoin, or I suppose a, a miner of Bitcoin and uh and cryptocurrencies at large, do you feel at least a little bit threatened by CBDCs? Could it not mean the end of cryptocurrencies if everybody, if, if adoption is basically forced upon the populace? Forget voluntary adoption. Everybody has to start using a Fed coin down the line. Suppose that happens. I mean that well, that so, I don't I don't have any I'm not I'm, I don't have any more money left to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> no, it's a great question, and 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 you know I talk to people in Washington all the time. And by the way, just to complete my quote on the last question yeah yeah try uh, we have a lot of mining uh, capacity in texas go to texas and try to tell those people that you're going to touch their energy or you're going to shut down something that has to do with their energy business let's see how you're going to do you know so so i'm not worried about shutting down of the uh of the bitcoin mining in north america the, to answer your question about cbdc's the united states uh historically has not really uh, done government mandated uh, uh, kind of growth and infrastructure and, and currency uh, um, uh, directives, right? So when you look at the United States, both Treasury and the Fed, I think, are very happy to continue letting companies like Circle and others issue uh, uh, dollar uh, denominated or dollar pegged digital assets which represent the digital dollar, but not necessarily issue its own CBDC. So I think the Chinese version is this communist, centralized uh, planning, 
you know, Silk Road uh, initiative to replace the dollar as a reserve currency of the world. And in the United States, we're going to do what we do best, which yes. is allow innovation, allow competition, and uh, we're going to win. Okay, we're going to win. We're going to follow up on that. We're going to follow up on this story. Hopefully, you're right. We're going to win. Uh, Alex, finally, I'm not going to disappoint the audience. Your price I, forecast. I was, I was born. I, I was born in a communist country, and I moved to the United States for a reason. So I know both systems pretty well, and I can tell you, we're going to win. You wouldn't. You wouldn't just uh, just sidetrack for a minute. You, you you're putting a lot of investments in Canada for your mining. You wouldn't. You wouldn't invest in your home country. You wouldn't. You wouldn't mine in Siberia. There's a lot of miners in Siberia. We, we had plenty of opportunities in Kazakhstan and Siberia and other places, uh, Mongolia. We did not, we chose to pay a little bit more. Uh, Canada is a perfect example. There's a lot of hydropower in Canada that is sold to the United States grid. And we're helping Canada actually capture more of that value because we're willing to pay more for that power that comes from renewable resources instead of them shipping it to the United States. So right. it's a win-win strategy and uh, more... It creates more GDP in Canada. It creates employment in Canada. So why not do that? And you're not, and, and, and just uh, real quick, you're not concerned about the environmental lobby groups uh, uh, pressuring you to shut down? So just like the internet, if you want the internet to be big and fast, you have to make huge investments in fiber and in infrastructure and everything else. You want the world to have renewable resources. And... Today, most countries in the world, including Canada, is less than 50% renewable. Uh, uh, Bitcoin mining is 76% renewable. So do you want to invest in re and enable renewable resources to grow? You have to grow demand. And, and Bitcoin is one of the easiest ways to create additional demand for renewable energy, which is the cheapest energy. No one is going to uh, invest in a uh, coal plant or, or, or any of these uh, filthy, uh, um, you know, resources, right? But by enabling more demand, you are guaranteeing the investment in wind, solar, and hydro. Interesting. That's yeah. That's an interesting side of the story that uh, isn't often reported. All right. Finally, price forecasts. We're not going to disappoint the audience. Let's talk about both Bitcoin and Ethereum because it ties into the first part of our interview, the flippening. Let's talk about Bitcoin first. Did you change your forecast? You had said potentially. Well, first of all, you made a number of accurate calls, right? You, you've said that Bitcoin could retrace $30,000. We've talked about this before on the show. You're calling for $160,000 potentially by year end. Are you sticking to that? Yeah, I, I think we're going to have another run up uh, after this China situation clears itself up and more and more uh, users. We, we have record users every day joining Bitcoin, right? So, so the number of wallets, uh, the total uh, owned by these wallets is at all time record high. Uh, so I, I definitely see, we already took all the leverage out of the system, right? We liquidated over a million and a half retail users, not Celsius, but the, the, basically all of the exchanges liquidated a lot of the people that were long on margin, uh, with this flash crash that we've had in the last few weeks. And because of that, there's no more leverage in the system. So now all the new buying demand. Uh, is actually going to push the prices higher. So I definitely seeing uh, us touching 140 to 160 thousand this year, but then retrenching and closing the year below 100 thousand. Okay, below 100 thousand. I mean, I I like how you kept that vague. Below 100 thousand could be 90, could be 10 dollars, could be. A <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I think I think it will be between 80 and 90 thousand. So that's my right. estimate because. You, you always have to keep in mind that there are sellers at every level. There's going to be sellers at 70,000 and 90,000 and 120,000. So the question is just how many sellers are going to show up at each price sure. level. And that's where you're going to hit the most resistance and you're going to have to retrench. So I think uh, my estimate is that, that those levels where you basically exhaust it, a blow of top is at that 140 to 160,000 level. Yeah. Well, your call was pretty accurate all last year. I remember we started speaking, uh, you and I, last summer, exactly a year ago, and your call was pretty spot on. Let's see if you're spot on two years in a row, Alex, two years in a row. Ethereum, let's talk about Ethereum. It's currently at about $2,100. Of course, for the flipping to happen, the price mathematically has to surpass the growth rate of Bitcoin. Could that happen this year? Yeah, so I think Ethereum needs to go uh, above uh, four or 5000 Per coin to uh, to basically hit 
uh, to be more valuable uh, than Bitcoin. That is definitely a very high, uh, uh, very difficult to do this year. It's going to take probably another year or two okay. uh, before that can happen. And really, a lot of it depends on how much uh, money is going to flow into DeFi, uh, how much of this uh, momentum can Ethereum maintain versus people using Cardano or Polkadot or some of the other chains, Solana and so on. So, so there's a lot of uh, uh, options here, a lot of issues, and uh, we'll see. Again, I'm, I'm watching our community. I know our community yeah. uh, represents the hodlers, represents the, the future. And uh, um, all I'm doing is uh, extrapolating the numbers based well, on their behavior. Ethereum was at 3,500, almost 4,000 earlier this year. So actually about a month ago, not even earlier this year, about a month ago. So definitely possible. But even at $5,000, Alex, that's... That's double the market cap. That's roughly, that would be roughly not even equal to Bitcoin's current market cap if you assume no growth at all in Bitcoin. So I, I think it actually needs to go even higher than $5,000 to surpass Bitcoin, right? Yes. Yeah, it needs yeah. to go higher. Uh, again, I'm comparing it to current levels. Yeah, but exactly. Definitely, if, if Bitcoin if Bitcoin's going to double or triple, yeah. and on average, on average, Bitcoin triples every year on average. So you can just do the math. But look, we are, we are going after all the money in the world, right? So, so, so this is not a, about adding another trillion or two to the market cap of uh, digital assets. A, a, as long as central banks uh, continue to print money endlessly, uh, there's almost a guarantee that all of that value will migrate from fiat to digital currencies. So. If you want to know how, how high Bitcoin and Ethereum goes, all you have to watch is uh, the Central Bank of England, which is actually the largest printer ever. It prints in percentage terms, even more than the Fed or the Bank of Japan. Uh, but you, everybody's printing, right? Every central bank is effectively printing. And all that does is debases their currency. A Bitcoin is still a Bitcoin. The question is just how many of these dollars, printed dollars, it takes to buy one Bitcoin. Excellent thoughts as always, Alex. Thank you for being so generous with your time today and thank you for all the great scoops. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow me on Twitter at DavidLin underscore TV. Stay tuned for more.